So what's up, people? This is Robert Mazzano. I'm coming to you guys today. And I got a follow-up email from the special agent in charge and resident investigator for NASA's Office of Inspector General Investigations Division. These are the guys that investigate fraud, waste, and abuse with NASA. Any type of contracting programs, you name it. They take complaints. So I got a follow-up email from, and it was pretty quick. It took them literally less than 24 hours to get back to me. And what I want to bring to you guys today is that the recommendation that was provided to me was that I contact the Goddard Space Center's um, Hubble Space Telescope team, HST. So we're going to do that today together. And we're going to see if we can get a hold of one of these team members. We're going to go down the list. I'm not going to go through the complete list, but we're going to dial their number together. And we're going to see how we can actually talk to one of these people to see if we can get some clear-cut answers on why on NASA's website there's no real-time video at all of the Hubble. There's only computer graphic generated images and video of what Hubble's supposedly supposed to be doing. Okay? Ain't nothing fucking top secret about space, people. If Hubble's looking out there, we should be able to see everything they see. Not something that's fucking redacted or watered down or computer generated to, you know, basically siphon out the whatever the fuck is else out there is looking at. Or even make a determination if the fucking thing even exists. I don't think it exists, but the question I'm going to ask one of these people who might answer the phone is, you guys got every other STS mission that serviced Hubble, but why isn't Hubble in the Federation Aeronautic International database? Okay? NASA is actually a member of this organization. It's older than NASA. So I want to know why they didn't file the application to put it in the record books as the greatest mass lifted to the greatest altitude. Okay? So let's see what they say. Let's dial the number. The number I was provided was 301-286-2000. So let's see what we can see. Okay? Thank you for calling NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, located on Greenbelt Road in Greenbelt, Maryland, 20771. Please select one of the following. For directions to the center, press 1. For departmental directory, press 2. For NASA employee directory, press 3. For Spell the last and first name, then press pound. For Q, press 7. For Z, press 9. For help, press 0. So they're asking me to spell the last name. Let's spell, let's spell Krause's last name. So we got C-R-O-U-S-E. For Patrick Krause. At extension 61067, press pound. To cancel, press star. Press pound. Okay. Immediately disconnected as soon as we pressed his extension. So let's try one more time. Pat Krause, as soon as we click the number, Thank you for calling they hung up on us. Space Flight Center, located on Greenbelt Road in Greenbelt, Maryland, 20771. Please select one of the following. For directions to the center, press 1. For departmental directory, press 2. Please select one of the following. For public affairs, press 1. For visitor center, press 2. For the Office of Human Capital Management, press 3. For security office, press 4. For procurement, press 5. For excess sales, press 6. For library, press 1. Uh, let's, let's try that one more time, people. Thank you for calling NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, located on Greenbelt Road in Greenbelt, Maryland, 20771. Please select one of the following. For directions to the center, press 1. For departmental directory, press 2. For NASA employee directory, press 3. For 
Spell the last and first name, then press pound. For Q, for Patrick Krause. At extension 61067, press pound. To cancel, press star. Press pound. Mr. Kraus, not available. Let's try the next gentleman, Mr. Jim Jellick. Jellitic. Thank you for calling Mayor Okay. Spell the last and first name, then press pound. For Q. A E L E T I C. There are two matching names. Select the name by number. For new search, press star. For Peter Bertoni. At extension 60674, press 1. For Kelly Gillettic. At extension 40980, press 2. No. Okay. Deputy Project Manager, not there. Let's go to Mission Operations Manager, Dave Haskins. Let's see if we can reach Mr. Haskins. Thank you. Spell the last and first name, then press pound. Thank you. There are four matching names. Select the name by number. For new search, press star. For Valerie Harkins. At extension 65075, press 1. For Dave Haskins. At extension 62114, press 2. Dave Haskins. Number immediately fucking hangs up. This is fucking incredible, people. None of these fucking people are available. Thank you for calling NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Spell the last and first name, then press pound. For Q, press seven. For For Mike. At extension 61437, press pound. To cancel, press pound. This is Mike. Mike, uh, Miss Miss Linsky. Yes. Mr. Miss Linsky, sorry about that. This is uh Robert Bassano. How are you? I'm a graduate student. I wanted okay. to I wanted to know if um there was just a couple of questions you could um help me out with with some answers. I'm on you guys' website right now, and um it's regarding Hubble. Okay. Okay. Who are you with? I'm 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 a graduate student at a university. Okay. What? I'm working I'm working on a MATLAB image processing toolbox application that processes um, a variety of images to determine the relation with other images that might have been manipulated or or amended or Maybe it was to determine the original source. So I'm for a project that I'm involved in, I'm actually using some of the images from Hubble and Sophia to conduct comparative analysis. That's it. So I have some questions regarding uh, HST that um, um, would help me out with 
kind of understanding a little bit more about um, some of the photos that are and images that are available on you guys' website that I'm looking at right now. Okay. Well, I, I, I have to refer you to our Science Institute for talking about the, the um, science images. Well, no, I, I don't. I don't need to talk about the science images per se. Okay. I'm I'm wanting to know if there are any available video images or any other assets in GeoSync that actually conduct sort of an inspection, a video or photographic inspection of HST as it goes around in GeoSync. Because I'm I'm looking at all the videos you guys have on online on NASA's website and all the videos that I've seen they're all CGI and computer generated, you know, um, uh, illustrations and other type of computer generated images that, that are not original source coming straight from Hubble or any other asset vehicle that may be within range of Hubble to take photographs of it. Okay, but again, I, I have to refer you to our science institute. Well, you're 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 the deputy you're the deputy missions operations manager, right? Yes, I am, but I'm, I'm not at liberty to talk to you about specific Hubble items. Well, I'm I'm not asking for specific Hubble items. I mean, well, let me let let me ask this general question: Are you able to okay. view Hubble in real time? Do you Hubble in real time? No. Yeah. Are you able? Are you able to obtain and view a real time image of Hubble as it is right now, wherever it is? No, we can't do that. Or is there any other vehicle that can view Hubble in operation? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Can can I ask you how long you've been working on the team at the with the HST HST team? I've been with HST over uh, twenty five years. Now, have there been any real time video high definition video images of Hubble at three hundred and thirty miles or so? Not that I'm aware. Of. There are none. Not that I'm aware. Of. Wow. Yeah, so S and T wouldn't be able to tell me anything. I mean, yeah, you're the I'm you're sorry, you're the DMO, you're the you're the you're the DMOM, and you're saying in 25 years you've never seen Hubble actually in real time. Well, we certainly had servicing missions. Well, yeah, you've had servicing missions, but you're not able to see. What's going on with Hubble from the ground in real time? We, we do not have optical tracking of Hubble from the ground. That's true. Okay. So 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 you don't have optical tracking of Hubble from the ground? No, we don't. Wow. So so if I if let's just say if I use my Celestron, there's no way for me to actually get a visual, real time visual of Hubble as it say was passing over Virginia. You might be able to you know, track the, the um, sunlight the lens off of it. Well, wait, wait, wait. I mean, I'll sunlight. be able to track what? Sunlight reflecting off of it. But operationally, we do not, we do not look at the vehicle you know, from the ground. These radio signals that transmit engineering data from the vehicle to us, but we do not look at it physically. Okay, when they when when STS missions or any other mission goes up to service Hubble, well, I mean, sir, mm -hmm. the last time Hubble was serviced was the last shuttle mission, right? Well, not the last shuttle mission, but you know, we were last serviced in um, two thousand eight. Now, so, so the last servicing mission was in 2008, and for, from the research I did, I think they put up the the, the WFPC-3 camera, right? That was the last camera installed. Right. Okay. So 
when they service, what what altitude is Hubble at when STS goes up to service it? I mean, does it drop down to uh, an altitude where STS, you know, can get within range of it? Or does STS go up to that altitude? The space shuttle goes up to that altitude. I'm just trying to wrap this and wrap my head around this because ISS is somewhere around 230, 240. Hubble's supposed to be almost 100 miles above ISS. But I've never, yeah. I've never seen any video from servicing where any STS mission has gone that far out above ISS. I mean, I know we have geosync out there, you know, way above that. But I've never seen that. I'm, that's what I'm trying to look for. I'm trying to find video in NASA's archive where they actually show the mission with them approaching and doing the orbits to, you know, gain altitude to get to Hubble. Or is there any, there's no other video available of that? I mean, I can understand if, if there is video and it's classified, that's completely understandable. I'm not, no one's ever going to see that. That's, that's, that's classified data. But are there any open source videos that would show this? It would actually show it from outside of um, the space shuttle. You talking about something watching the space shuttle? Yeah, just showing showing STS actually getting ready to approach Hubble to capture it so it can be serviced. No, I, I, I know no one's no video showing that. You know. So, a, a, as Deputy Mission Operations Manager, I, and and this is more of a mathematical question. Maybe you can or cannot answer it. I had watched a um, video of Don Pettit talking about the tyranny of the rocket equation. So based on the way to Hubble, um, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out the math on how much fuel, was there more than 93 or 95% fuel required to get 25,000 pound telescope up in geosync? Are you talking about the fuel on, on the space shuttle? Yeah, I mean, when, 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 when HST yeah, launched, yeah. When HST launched, that's 25,000 yeah, pounds. To, they actually took us to the highest altitude possible you know, that they could achieve. Um, and what was that? With the space shuttle. Pardon? What was that, what was that altitude? Well, I'd have to look that up. I, I don't know that number offhand. Because um, it, it, I, I looked at about a dozen, um, tele, a dozen videos with telemetry data. And I always see STS separate from the main fuel tank at around 340, 350,000 feet. And then it continues on, you know, gain, you know, accelerating and gaining velocity so it could get at, at terminal velocity of around 17,000. But then from there, I've never seen any other footage um, where STS is, is gone higher than ISS. It's certainly, you know, like you said, we're, we're about 100 miles above ISS. Yeah, it's about 100. Now, yeah. let, let me, the, the one critical question I want to ask is this. Are you familiar with the Federation Aeronautic International Database, the FAI.org? No, I'm not. Okay. No, I'm not. Well, I, I, I am, and NASA is actually a member of FAI. Every single, well, not, I wouldn't say every single STS mission, but I'd say about two-thirds of the STS missions specifically the servicing missions for HST are mm -hmm. in this database. It's FAI.org, Federation Aeronautic Internationale. And when I put in, when I put in the data for, for STS-31 on April 24th, 1990, nothing comes up. So I put in, I decided to use some other uh, uh, search query factors i put in the crew members names um nothing comes up i put in the sts mission number nothing comes up so then i decided okay this falls under another category and they have a list of category that describe you know 
one or more astronauts traveling to a celestial body, one or more astronauts, the amount of time they spent in space, so on and so forth, you know, um, durations. So I decided to click on the, the, the selection that says greatest mass lifted to greatest altitude. Okay. So I would, I just, I automatically and logically assumed that, you know, STS was one of the greatest mass, if not the greatest mass lifted to greatest altitude of 330 miles. And there's nothing in the database. So over a period of four months, I kept checking the database. And FAI actually update, they, they shut down the website and then updated their database. Um, and, and I'm not sure if this was direct, but I had sent them an email saying, you know, I'm looking for this particular mission on this particular date. It goes to data. Um, is there a possibility that you have a problem updating your database? Could you please let me know or correct this? So a few days later, the website went down and it came back up. So I, I went searching for the data again. Now, I'm making a weekly habit of doing this checking, 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 because maybe it's just some sort of database entry error that that's common in just about every single local, national, international database with, with, with that type of um, error that may occur where maybe I'm not using the, the right search criteria. So I sent FAI.org an email asking them, could you please let me know if I'm not looking at this the right way, could you locate this information in your database? They sent me back an email telling me, no, this is not, this was not registered in our database. No one filed an application for this to be put into the record book. So the conclusion I'm coming to is this. Is there, is there a reason why NASA didn't put HST, HST in, in the record books, but they put every servicing mission in the record books? Because every servicing mission is listed, but HST, STS-31 on April 24, 1990 is not listed. I, I can't speak to that, but, you know, obviously that's not a NASA uh, database. No, no, I, and I, and I, yeah, I do. I, I'm completely, I understand that. But, again, I know it's not a database that NASA maintained in the database at all. Hmm. So, I, I, please forgive me for saying this. Just please forgive me, and I don't want it to sound like some sort of crackpot idea or weird conspiracy because that's not where I'm going with this. I have to say that I'm questioning that Hubble is even where they say it is. Because why wouldn't a $1.5 billion telescope, which is being used by every university around the world, and every scientist who's involved in any kind of astrophysics, astrodynamics, just space exploration period, if we're getting these images from Hubble and SOFIA, which is a 747 special purpose, with the same exact technical specifications when it comes to the telescope, SOFIA is taking the same exact pictures of Hubble. And that's where the, that's where the disparity in image analysis comes in, because I have a half a dozen photos I took off from NASA's website for Hubble and Sophia, and when I ran them through MathLab's image processing toolbox for comparative analysis, that those images came from the same source, and it wasn't at it wasn't at 330 miles above the surface of the Earth. So that's oh, that's, that's where I'm I'm trying to understand. You know, I'm I'm mostly into IT, sir. That's what I do. I'm into information technology, security engineering, and database management. And I know NASA has massive, a massive, massive database. You guys got over a dozen supercomputers all around the country, all around the world that need to be managed about just about by any and everybody. And their tasks are, are solely to keep, the, to keep the systems up to date and make sure they're operating efficiently and effectively so that you can be able to go to your computer terminal and type up a query and that information comes up literally in a nanosecond. That's how readily available it is. So my, my, my problem right now is that 
it makes no sense to me and why STS-31 is not in the database. And you confirm that you've worked for them for 25 years and nobody sitting in at Goddard who's on the Hubble team has ever seen Hubble in real time conducting any operations on the ground that could have been shot from another satellite asset with a high definition camera and imaging to take a picture of Hubble. The only videos well, that it goes go ahead. Why do you expect anybody to do that? Well I, I'm I'm gonna explain to you why. Because I used to be in the military, intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance. You don't send okay. out a drone or an ROV and not have cameras on it so that you can track where it's going and where it's at and what might come in contact with it to interfere with its operations. And I and just to be honest with you, if you know, paying my taxes, one and a half billion dollars, I'd want to keep an eye on that asset. Not just from signal and telemetry data, but I also in the year you know, in the twenty first century, I need to have eyes on when I need to have eyes on, just in case something went wrong. Well, if, if something goes wrong, it, it wouldn't be something external necessarily. No, it, that's not. Okay. That's not. I wouldn't say that that's so because I, I I know of at least a few events where Hubble had to be retasked because it had to avoid collision with with something else that was up there. Well, you're misinformed then. Well, I I, I can't be misinformed if the data actually came from NASA. Could you share for me to where it says that the power was actually recast because of, of some external, I'll, I'll call it a threat, or external, you know, object? No, I mean, it just, it had to be flipped around, it had to be maneuvered to go to either, a, a go to a higher altitude or, or, or change its trajectory because there was, an, there was something up there that might have collided with another satellite from another country. Well, you're... you're you are sadly misinformed then. Okay. Because Hubble doesn't even have a propulsion system, so it can't possibly change its orbit by so, itself. So how does it move position? How do you change I the position of it? You, I suggest that you build up a little bit more on... No, I mean, I have the data right in I have the data right up in front of me. I mean, it, you, it's right on your website. It, it's right here, Spacecraft and Instruments. I'm looking, it's right on the left-hand side. It's an entire oh, PDF. Right. It says what the Hubble's what capabilities it? are, how it maneuvers, how it changes direction. That, that's just rotating the vehicle. That is not changing altitude. That is not changing trajectory. That is not changing orbit. Okay. That is just changing its orientation. So you're saying that Hubble actually stays at the same altitude through every orbit and it doesn't decay in altitude. It doesn't lose altitude. It loses altitude because of atmospheric drag. Okay, so when it loses altitude, so over 20 probably. years at 330 miles, we do the mathematics, ISS loses somewhere between one and a half to two miles every five, three to five minutes. So what is what is keeping over twenty years? Hubble should actually almost be within ten miles of ISS. Well, I, I sir, I've done the math. I don't know about you, sir, but I've done the math. At three hundred and forty miles, that's what's on your website. Fifteen orbits a day. Hubble should actually be nearly within ten miles of ISS if ISS is actually at. Somewhere around 220, 245 miles. That's that's the stated standard data. I've actually seen data on NASA's website. It's clear as day. I can send you the information. Where actually ISS has gone from 245 miles to 190 miles above the surface of the Earth, and then it jumped, and then they fired whatever thrusters or whatever to put it back up into its normal. Geosync orbit at low Earth or in low Earth or, uh, altitude um, elliptical orbit. So if you're saying, I 
I'm not disagreeing. Yes, Hubble is losing altitude. But if that's the case and there's nothing to pro propel it back up to its original operating altitude of 340 miles, over a 20-year period, Hubble should be, this year, within 10 to 20 miles of the ISS. Well, Visual line of sight. No, no optical are, are uh, assessment or adjustment. I'm sorry? Are you familiar with orbital mechanics? Yes, sir, I am. Are you familiar with atmospheric drag? Yes, sir, I am. I know that Hubble, I know the, the ISS. Cycle? I'm sorry, sir? Are you familiar with the solar cycle? Yes, sir, I am. And its effect on, on the atmosphere? Yes, sir, I am. I, that's, I've been doing okay. nothing but studying that for three years. Okay, so you, obviously, you know, during solar minimums, the atmosphere contracts and there's very, very little drag at, at Hubble's altitude. So your two miles per year is, is a very gross um, oversimplification. No, no, no. I, I didn't say two miles per decay. year. No, I didn't say two miles per year. ISS is 100, yard long, 100 yard, yards long, 50 yards wide, give or take. Okay? It's three okay. times, it's three to five times the size of Hubble. Okay, so you have mm -hmm. a larger mass, you know, traveling at somewhat maybe, you know, a comparable speed. It's at lower altitude, so yes, you're going to have more drag. Hubble's at 100 miles, supposed to be 100 miles above that. So yes, you're going to have less atmosphere, but a little bit more, you know, uh, you're still going to have the atmospheric drag because neither vehicle is, is in free space, a vacuum. Right. Neither vehicle. And, and also, that the Hubble rocket was raised during the servicing on um, two of the servicing missions. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. You're you're right. You're right. I agree with you on that because I looked at the servicing missions, and it seems as though Hubble each servicing mission Hubble dropped down based on its 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 fifteen orbits a day. It's if it's if it's Behaving the same way the ISS is, losing about a, hundred, a mile and a half to two miles every five minutes in an elliptical fashion, if Hubble's doing the same thing, that means that the STS servicing missions were able to get within a specific distance of it at a specific time to capture it, and then once they service it, they basically jettison it back up to where it should have been, which is around 330, 340 miles. But then after after 2008, the last servicing mission, we're looking at eight years. So again, you factor in from 2008 to now, within this year, Hubble's going to be within 15, 10 to 20 miles of ISS. That's, that's no. mathematics, sir. <laughs> that's math. That's that's the mathematics that you and I've learned. Give or take. I'm not I don't have a supercomputer, so I can't do the exact numbers, but the rough calculations tell me that Hubble could be within visual eyesight view without a telescope, without binoculars, you'd be able to have literally line of sight from ISS to take maybe a cannon. 100 millimeter, 300 millimeter camera, fl flip around backwards and take a photo of it when it passes over the ISS. Well, I, I do not know what the ISS current altitude is. Well, I, um, um, I think the the current altitude of ISS should be somewhere, because um, ESA actually listed. And again, I mean, I had asked this question of why isn't, you know, HST in this international database. I know someone at NASA is submitting the application for all other STS missions. Why didn't someone decide to submit the most important piece of technology ever to exist to mankind, put it in the international database? No other country is ever going to launch something that big, especially a telescope. Right now, the ISS is at 
according to this data, it says the ISS is at 251.77 miles. 76, it's dropping right now. And its okay. velocity is 17,166 miles. Longitude okay. 153.883, actually 154. Latitude is 39.517. That's where ISS is right now. Of course, they don't okay. have any, there's no similar database online to do the same thing for Hubble. Um, and that's understandable. But, um, yeah, yeah, but there is. is. Is there a website for, same as ISS? Well, I don't know what you're using for ISS. It's well, I'm using, like, um, I'm using uh, ISS Tracker. ISSTracker.com. Okay. Okay. And ESA I actually mean, listed as well. European Space Agency. Yeah, I'm using ISSTracker.com. This is real-time data. This is supposedly real-time data. Mm-hmm. Well, so, there's so plenty of satellite tracking apps that you know, have a well, yeah, I mean, large I, database. Yeah, yeah. I, I have about, you know, 20 of them in my, my repertoire that I can check. I can't check them simultaneously, okay. but I go after the ones that are reliable because I've, I've found a few sites where they actually try to manipulate the data. But these are third parties who have no affiliation to the space agency. So ISS Tracker actually uses the data right off of European Space Agency. Okay. Well, there, there's certainly similar ones for, for Hubble. I mean, you can get Hubble's real time position. Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, I, I don't want to waste a lot of your time. Mike, you know, it, it just, it, it concerned me. I'm going to be honest with you. It really concerned me that HST was not in an international database, but the servicing missions are. Mm -hmm. So why would you put all the servicing missions, but you wouldn't put the primary mission to even put the vehicle where it is? I got another theory too I, on on atmospheric drag that I'm actually playing around with. I'm starting to look deeper into superfluid helium four, and you know, it's just one of those type of things that I, I've seen it do some really strange things in a laboratory setting. And uh, some other colleagues of mine at the university were actually entertaining the idea, the possibility theoretically, that the upper atmospheres beyond HST could be superfluor helium. It's zero viscosity, zero viscosity, but what we're trying to ascertain is could it be actually a combination of what CERN and NASA are considering to be dark matter or dark fluid, which is absorbing 99.96% of all visible light and that's why when you're looking at these videos of HS, HST being serviced, you see absolutely no other light. Absolutely none. And it has nothing to do with the resolution of the camera and what mode the camera may be in to capture that type of light. If you've got billions of stars out into free space, then, or even within atmosphere, even a cluster should be generating some sort of light and you see absolutely nothing. And the only way that that's possible is, is if actually what you're looking at when you're up in altitude in space, which is beyond 328,000 feet, is you're looking at dark fluid and superfluid helium because the only way a, a vehicle the size of a school bus or the size of a football field could be in geosync orbit performing those operations would be in a helium environment, a liquid fluid helium environment where the temperature is almost absolute zero. You can do it in a laboratory. That may be what's up above us. And what kind of density are you talking about? Um, well, the, the, the density is already stated with helium. Uh, helium four, helium four is is is. It, I, I'm just trying. I'm still trying. Everyone's trying to wrap their head around how could it actually still stay a liquid at absolute zero. 
See, no, no one, no one can answer that. And I've looked at every university paper I could possibly collect, and it can't be simulated. You can't get anything to absolute zero on Earth. It just we don't have the mm -hmm. technical capability to do it, and you, and you can't do it on the ISS because the ISS can't. I mean, it, you're in a microgravity environment. There's atmosphere. You can't create it in a vacuum either, because there is no such thing as a complete vacuum. And the reason why I say you can't do it in a vacuum is because the 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 Glenn Research Center has the largest vacuum chamber in the world, but it's a contained environment. Meaning that you have walls, you have limits. You you have to you just you can't create a vacuum chamber large enough to duplicate the potential experiment to get close enough because if you did, you'd probably suck half of NASA into that vacuum chamber if there was some sort of malfunction. I mean it would just it would be a massive implosion. And you can't contain superfluid helium even at close to absolute zero for the simple fact that you you have to create some sort of carbon nanotube type of container just to keep it in the in in the container because it it wants to find its way out of what it's being contained in. <laughs> and when you look when you look at what Siri nanosystems did in UK by creating Vanta Black and you combine that with superfluid helium and then you hear scientists are saying that dark matter, aka dark fluid, and you put the two together, you've got your space environment. That's the only way something the size of a football field and the size of a school bus could move around at potentially five times the speed of sound in a micro in a quasi microgravity environment for as long as it, it, it is, because what they're saying about superfluid helium is that there's these quantum vortices created, whirlpools, that are spinning at incredible speeds. And what happens is that when they release droplets of superfluid helium in this vacuum, what they witnessed and observed in a control and experiment environment was that the droplets didn't break apart like normal water molecules would break apart. They remained together, and they ended. They they formed a, a flattening, ellipsoid, egg-shaped type of form. And it made it started to make sense to me. Wait a minute, that's the only way these vehicles could be up there traveling at those speeds. Because if not, they come crashing down within years, not decades. Just some theoretical talk. I'm just throwing it out there. I'm not in. I'm not a physicist. I'm working on my uh, master's in applied physics, but um, trying to get an understanding. And Hubble is continuing to baffle me. Yeah. Right now, they're showing the Hubble at uh, the latitude is twenty. Uh, what's the elevation? The altitude is 542 kilometers. Yeah, okay, sounds about right. So, you know, but it's a software database, and I can tell you here right now, as a CUDA and GPU programmer and developer, I could create the same thing in a week to mirror this, and it wouldn't need to be real. It literally show a picture of me in a little. Superman cape saying, "Hey, this is where I am. I'm, I got my hands up. I'm, I've, I've got a little tether on the hubble, and I'm following it. And look at me, you know. And people would, mm -hmm. pe but, but here's the thing: if I showed you that and put it together in a week, you'd be like, oh, that's not real, you know. But I want you to understand, as you know, an up and coming research scientist, the average person, you know, they look at this and they're like, oh, well, there, there goes the hubble." At 542 kilometers. Mm -hmm. But you show them something. They don't know. They don't. They don't have a, an, a even a basic or foundation understanding of how software development, programming, and computer graphic generated images 
and how you can actually program something to be in the sky that's really not there. All right. Yeah. So. I look at it all the time. No, no, I know, I know. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I've actually taken advantage of you guys' uh, software vault where I can go online and download a lot of the software applications that's available for the technology transfer program. So, you know, it's just one of those things to where I, 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 I would like to know if it's possible of anyone I could speak to who's responsible for submitting the information to FAI to see if maybe there was just an oversight or if it's a mistake or, and I hate to say this, that maybe you've been sitting there for 25 years and there's, what you think is up there is really not there, and it's actually the photos are being taken by Sophia, which is at 45,000 wow. feet on a 747. Sophia hasn't been flying nearly as long. Well, the program, the stratospheric observatory program has been in existence longer than, than Hubble. But they haven't had anything flying for that long. I thought she had one Sophia's first. No, 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 yeah, Sophia is not, not that old. It's been in existence, I think, since, what, 2002 or something, or 2000, what was it, 2004, I think 2002 or 2004, but there were airborne telescope observatories being flown longer than Hubble. They were just, they even, you got, your own website shows the actual history of the stratospheric observatory program. And it actually began with balloons because there's a satellite identical to Hubble, about two-thirds the size, that was launched from Antarctica on a balloon. There's a photo of that on on uh, the U.S. Antarctic website. They, yeah. la they launched yeah. it from McMurdo. Well, fine, but, you know, the Hubble was taking data um, yeah, at wavelengths that Neither yeah. Sophia nor the balloons can. Um, no, no, no. Achieve. Sophia can take. So. Sophia can take photos in wavelength. Sophia can do the same I thing mean, as Hubble. Yeah. Sophia can do. The, matter of fact, the telescope on Sophia is identical to Hubble. Everything that Hubble can do, Sophia can do. Now, I, I, I mean, of course, the plane's got to land, but when it's in the air. It can literally conduct the same technical imagery capture and analysis data that Hubble can do. And, of course, Hubble's 24-7. Sophia's not. But when it's in the air, when Sophia's been in the air, it, it, it literally has captured the same photos as Hubble, and that's how I was able to do the comparison. As a matter of fact, okay. some of the pictures that Sophia captured were actually at a higher resolution and more clear than Hubble. Which, which also, you know, you know, surprised me a little bit. How could something inside the stratosphere take a photo and do imagery through three or four different more layers of atmosphere when Hubble is literally supposed to be out in the exosphere where there's very little to no atmosphere and it's, it's capturing more light than, than uh, Sophia is. I, I I really hope I'm wrong. I really do. I hope I'm wrong about Hubble. Because I, I wouldn't want to be sitting next to you one day and you'd be really, really, really angry to find out <laughs> that, that Hubble may not be there. <laughs> well, it, it'd be quite a, um, I know it would be shocking, but it... Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. It would be shocking, but it just... I've already contacted FAI and I spoke to them and they said it's not in their database and they, they checked. It took them about a week to get back to me and they looked through the entire database. They said it, they even looked to see if maybe it would have been erased or deleted by mistake, you know, because they were able to check their log records and there was never even anything submitted. Mm. There was nothing. I mean, why put the servicing missions in the record? I mean, you can go to FAI.org when we hang up. Just check the servicing messages for yourself. You'll see them there. But when you when you check for Hubble, STS-31, you, you're entering Charlie Bolden's name, all the crew members, nothing. Nothing. And FAI has been in existence longer than NASA. I mean, 
you know, Theodore von Karman was the one who helped create the database and establish where, where space actually began. Of course, NASA puts it at 262,000 feet, and FAI puts it at 328,000, but that's neither here nor there. That's another question. How is it that DOD puts space at 262,000 and change in feet, but the rest of the world has it almost 90 to 100,000 feet higher? So where does space actually begin? Is it DOD standard or is it international standard? Mm -hmm. So I know that we've been studying the atmosphere for since we could be able to do what we can do. And we're still trying to figure it out. Um, what is actually up there and how it all works. And um, I think I'm not going to say that I'd be applying for any kind of Nobel science prize but i think i might have a more viable theory of how it may all be working hmm. Interesting. Because, because dark well, fluid i gotta go yes sir I'm good good i really appreciate it mike more. i really appreciate it Sorry. very much um i didn't think i'd be able to talk to anyone at all because i tried to call the project manager and when you click on uh -huh. how to go to his number and I click to the deputy project manager, Mr. Haskins, Haskins, and um, the deputy project manager, project manager Pat Krause. When I go to click on for their extensions, it just hangs up. Are they even working there anymore? Um, yeah, they're still here. So, so where, what, what side are you looking at to get the numbers? No, I didn't get the numbers. It just I, I I was given a number by the Goddard Center, and they told me to dial two thousand, and it asked you to put in the prompts, press three for the uh, oh. directory. So I don't have your direct number. It just it says your extension. It says press this button to speak to this person. So uh, okay. When you I press the you. button, it doesn't go to them at all. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I can't explain that. Yeah. Okie dokie. So okay. I really appreciate it, sir. I really do appreciate it. You no have problem. a good Memorial Day weekend, and uh, stay safe. You Take care, sir. Bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it, people. You heard the conversation. You heard it. You heard it clear as day. This guy could not answer why the Hubble is not in the FAI.org database. They all said the same thing. NASA's Office of, in, in, Office of Inspector General, their special agent investigator says, that's not a NASA website. We don't manage it. We don't operate it. We're not responsible for it. But they put all their other fucking missions in this database, but they didn't put Hubble. They put the servicing missions in the database, but they didn't put Hubble. This guy can't explain it at all. He said he's never fucking seen the Hubble. Never seen it. He's not even sure it's there. But I guarantee you, I got him fucking thinking. I got him seriously fucking thinking right now that there's a possibility he's been sitting at that desk for 25 fucking years. 25 years. 25 years. And now he's thinking, man, I just talked to this guy. Is it fucking possible? Could he be fucking right? That Hubble is not where it is? He couldn't even explain how the shuttle can actually get to this fucking thing. He says it has no jets, propulsion, no nothing. It loses altitude, people. It's been losing altitude since 2008. It may not even fucking be there, man. This, I knew more about their fucking program than they do. That's NASA for you people. That's fucking NASA. I got to put together this video. I'm going to post it on my site. And it's going to be private. I have to put it private because I don't want any fucking problems right now. So let me see how I'm going to do this, people. But you know my motto. It's not what you know. It's what you can prove. And that, people, 
was the fucking phone call of the year. Peace out, people. Take care.